Good afternoon. Looks like we've got a few of the working group members on now. I'll give it about another minute just to make sure that we have everyone who was able to attend today. All right, good afternoon. This is Rosa Mendez with DEC, the Director of the Office of Environmental Justice. We're gonna get started with our Climate Justice Working Group meeting now. I did hear from a couple of working group members that they're gonna be a few minutes late, so we'll just go ahead and get started. Alana, if you could advance our slides, please. Quick reminder of our meeting procedures. We ask that working group members stay on mute unless they are speaking, and this just allows us to have a efficient environment to hear everyone and get through our work. Next slide, please. We want to thank everyone for joining us today, and we'll go through a round of introductions so that we all know who's on, and we'll start with Elizabeth, are you on? Yeah, uh, buenos dia, Elizabeth Jean Pierre from Uprose in Brooklyn. Thank you, Elizabeth. Do we have Rawa? Good afternoon, everyone. Rawa Gramatin with Push Buffalo. And Jerry. Good afternoon, folks. Jared Bly with the Adirondack North Country Association. And do we have Amy? Hello, happy sunny day. Amy Klein from Capital Roots. And Sonal. Hi everyone, Sonal Jessel, um, we act for environmental justice. Okay, and do we have Neil? Yep, hey, good afternoon everybody. And Joe McNearney. Hello, sorry for that. This is Joe McNearney with the uh, New York State Department of Labor. Hey, Joe. I know Chris Cole is going to be a little late today. Do we have Eddie Bautista? Hola. Hey, Eddie. Great, I also heard from Donathan that he has a conflict and Mary Beth is also gonna be a few minutes late. So that is everyone for the working group. Amanda and Alex, do you wanna introduce yourselves? Hello, this is Alex Dunn from Illum Advising. And this is Amanda Dwelly from Illum Advising. All right, thank you everyone. I'll just note that today we also have assisting us on the call today, Alana Kadel Tucky from the EJ office, who's graciously advancing our slides for us and keeping track of the chat box as well. And Commissioner Sagos is joining us today to listen and see how we're all doing and keep track of your efforts today. Hi, everybody. Um, Good to see you all. Thanks, Commissioner. 
Okay, great, Alana, let's go to our agenda slide. Today we have, we'll go over our business items, approving of the minutes and reflections on the past meeting. We're also gonna talk about public engagement as part of the climate justice working group process. And then we'll continue with our indicators and data discussion led by Alex of the Alum team. Okay, next slide, please. So first for our business items, just a quick reflection of our last meeting on January 27th, we had the waste advisory panel joining us for that session. They gave a, a little summary of what they are working on as a panel. And then there was a, a Q and A between the working group members and the panel members as well. And then we had a discussion going through the application of our evaluation rubric on the indicators. And that was led by Alex from the loom and it included going through a gap analysis so that we could understand how the indicators were scored using that rubric and then going through each pillar to understand where we might have gaps um, after we did the scoring. So Alex also asked a couple of questions about how can we address those gaps? What are other things that we can look at to get us through this process? And then we, provided that worksheet after the meeting so we could get further reflection from the working group members on that. And then Alex and the Illum team began the process of pulling the data that supports those indicators so we could take a look at that data. And that's gonna be part of our discussion today. Does anyone from the working group wanna add to that reflection or open up any discussion on the draft minutes you received from that meeting? I'm not seeing any hands raised. Does anyone want to open a vote on the minutes to move the draft to final? This is Jared. I will. Great. Is there a second? I will. Okay, great. And this worked pretty well last time. If everyone will recall that the feedback button, the one that looks like a little loudspeaker on the side of your screen where it lists all the participants. Uh, we use that to indicate yes or no for the voting. So if everyone could find that button and indicate your yes or no to moving the minutes to final. All right, great. And the yeses have it. Thanks everyone. I also thought we could get any reflections from the working group members who did attend the March 10th transportation advisory panel meeting. I think a couple of you were able to attend that event and listen in and ask some questions of those panel members. Does anyone who attended that meeting want to give uh, some thoughts from what you heard there? Uh, this is Jared. I didn't attend the meeting, but I read the minutes before coming into this meeting. It sounded like there was some pretty robust discussion. So I am very interested in hearing um, from the members who were able to make that, you know, what their thoughts are. So I know Mary Beth was in attendance, but she's not going to be able to join us till later. So maybe we can get a recap at a different time and share that with all of the working group members. Yeah, I think, oh, this oh, is go ahead, I think one thing that we did talk about is ownership structures and ownership opportunities for frontline communities um, to own some of the transportation infrastructure as we um, transition to um, clean energy. Um, so I think that they were excited to hear about those considerations. I'm not 100% certain where that's gonna go, um, but uh, that was discussed and it seemed to be well received. Great, thanks, Rawa. All right, is hi, there? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, hi, this is Joe. Um, one of the things, and I think it's 
um, Rawa had mentioned it, but one, one thing that I liked too was it was specifically mentioned, I think Rawa, you might've mentioned it, but about with those frontline communities, the amount of jobs and having a realistic expectation. So instead of saying we're gonna have, or, or we're like not being ambiguous, we're just gonna have a lot of new different types of energy jobs that we're training for be specific. We're gonna have, you know, two dozen or we're gonna have 50 at this facility or something like that so that we're not creating um, unrealistic expectations in the community for these um, high road, uh, new green energy jobs. I thought that was a really neat thing that it sounded like the transportation committee was gonna bring that explicit thought into their planning and future uh, growth. Great, thanks, Joe. Good question. Go ahead, Eddie. Hey, apologies. Um, Rosa, do you remember the the date of that of that meeting? The reason I'm asking is because um, uh, Nija's representative has been out sick for a couple of weeks, and and I don't know if she was out when the uh, workshop happened. It was March 10th, but I, I can't recall if Renee was there. Robert, do you remember? She wasn't. No. Yeah, I was. I was a little surprised there wasn't representation mm -hmm. from <laughs> Nija because I was like, There's, they've been working on these issues so much longer than mm -hmm. us. We can only speak really. I think to uh, the ways we envision the transition should happen for our community, but then there are some nuances there that I know got missed. Um, hopefully there will be another meeting in which Nija can actually participate in. Thanks, Rob. No, no, this is really helpful. And, and, and I'm, I'm saying this for a couple of reasons. Uh, by the way, there's some background noise. I don't know if anyone's outdoors or they can mute or something, but um, uh, yeah, it, it sounds like it was where Renee's been out um, uh, on leave for a couple of weeks. Um, the reason I'm asking is because there have been issues I know she's been raising in the transportation group, uh, areas of concern that we have in terms of what the committee may be looking at in terms of uh, methodologies or technologies to, to be uh, included or thought of um, as part of the mix. Um, uh, we have repeatedly, uh, not just Nijam, but our members and, and allies have raised um, multiple concerns about the use of renewable natural gas. Um, and, um, you know, there's also the ongoing critique that we have about the transportation and climate initiative. The, the reason why I'm saying all this is that if, if they weren't there, uh, we are part of obviously, a, you know, New York Renews and New York Renews just put out a report today called false solutions that includes the critique that we have, uh, you know, of some of these issues we're hearing pop up in different committees. Uh, and we thought it might be useful for everyone if we could compile uh, what the critiques are, what we're calling false solutions. Um, and we're hoping that we can, you know, and the intent is to share it with, with, with as many people as possible uh, so that we can avoid scenarios like this when one of us is on a committee and it's the only one that's raising an issue and they're not there. We now have um, the false solutions report that hopefully um, uh, you all will, will, you know, the government side as, as well as this, the rest of this working group and the other committees, so you can um, get a deeper dive into the particulars about why we have issues with some of the uh, fuel sources that folks are thinking about, or you know, why can't green hydrogen work in a power plant and stuff like that. So uh, we urge folks to. Uh, uh, both state and, and, and other committee reps, if you want to get a sense of where the environmental and climate justice um, areas of significant concern are and how these conversations uh, are unfolding in some of these committees, I urge you to please read that report. Thank you. Yeah. If, 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 if I find that online, can you just email that around if you, if you get a chance? Uh, Commissioner? Thanks. Yep. Well, Thanks, Eddie. Sure. Basil. <laughs> if I may, I just want to add to what Eddie just said. Uh, we're going to continue to have this problem since industry folks and people with more resources will always be able to be present at a lot of these meetings. And, um, and those of us from the EJCJ movement have less capacity. That really important that each of the working groups uh, is not just centered in equity and racial justice, but really understands our frameworks and that those frameworks become the guiding post. Uh, to how recommendations get developed uh, in each of these working groups. If we do that, then um, the working groups will really honor the work of the CLCPA and of the recommendations that are coming out of the front line. And that way we don't have to run from one group to the other because that guidance will be there. 
Thanks, Elizabeth. That's a that's a good point that we we could create something, or I'm sure you already have materials that are uh, speaking to the framework that provided could also be a, a guidepost or a way for the panels to consider the issues that they they've been asking us to work with them on. We, we do, and we're happy to share those with you. Thanks. All right, any other reflections uh, from our past meetings or from transportation or other business items before we jump into the rest of the agenda? Okay, great. Alana, will you move us forward, please? Okay, so the next item we wanted to bring up, I have a a screenshot of our work plan on the screen because this was the time that we thought would be when we would start talking about how are we going to engage the public in our process. I know that from the legislation, there are six regional public hearings called for as part of the draft criteria and a 120 day public comment period. So I wanted to open up that discussion here with the working group members on how you see the best avenue for engaging the public to make sure that it's not only robust but that it's meaningful because we really want the public to understand what we're doing and to help shape what we're doing a um, couple things you know to note that the legislation called for six public hearings uh, i think they were envisioning they would be in person but we should be considering how to accomplish that virtually. One, one thought I did have based on some of the things I've heard at past meetings with the working group is that we could do a structure where maybe three of our sessions could be kind of a webinar style so that we could introduce the indicators that we're working with and give sort of the explanation or the background on how we came to those indicators um, what the data sets mean, more of an education session so that we get the, the public understanding what we've been doing up to that point. And then have the other public sessions be more of the traditional, what we would call a public comment hearing where everyone who attends, the participants have a couple of minutes each to give us feedback on what we're doing. That's one way that I thought we could kick off this discussion, talk about how you feel about that structure or other ways you think would be best to structure our public engagement. So I'll turn the floor over to the working group members for your take on public engagement. So if I may, um, should I just like, is there a way of like raising my hand? I don't want to like, Okay. There's a way, you know, so I'm trying to monitor the the box so I see everyone's hands, but if you don't unraise it, it you know, it kind of stands yeah. on the whole time. So I get a little okay. confused. <laughs> All right. All right. So so I like the idea of having an educational piece because I think that central to meaningful community engagement means that people really need to know exactly what it is that's being discussed. And without the the education piece, what happens is that the most privileged people really sort of hijack the gathering and and the people who actually are really insular and have been in these conversations with the, with each other for a while uh, really dominate the space and then you find that uh, that our communities get marginalized what i would add is that uh before we start talking uh going really deep into the weeds that we frame it uh that we have a presentation about what climate justice is what it isn't what communities are what communities are most impacted, uh, maybe a little bit about what communities are doing throughout the state to address um, um, some of the challenges uh, that are putting our communities in harm's way so that people aren't coming into a deep conversation without being able to see the forest. Um, if they're coming to this conversation for the first time, they need to know, they need to have context. And so uh, what I would offer is that we provide that context and that uh and then the, then that then we go a little deeper and, and open it up so that people can become meaningfully engaged so i would ask for that i'd also like to make sure that materials that are disseminated are distributed in different languages and that uh the capacity is built in for uh for um for people to also participate in different languages 
check. Great, thanks, Elizabeth. Others? I would I would definitely echo what Elizabeth is saying in terms of framing uh, the issues. I think you know these are complicated issues, and uh, I think we want to make sure everybody is on a level playing field, and it, you know goes into the discussions with the base understanding of you know what it is that we're here to discuss and and what the background is. Um, I also, um, you know, I want to make sure that there's, uh, and I know this committee was put together for this purpose, and and we have good representation on the working group across the, the state, and so you know, following up on those examples, making sure that we're covering the state in terms of that information, and um, lastly, I'll just say in terms of language, I think that is also really important. Um, but also thinking about the nuances of that, depending on where you are in the state, um, because uh, different areas of the state have different um, language needs. And um, so that can also be a big challenge just because of, of that issue. Uh, but I think that would really um, make a significant difference. The other thing um, I just always worry about also is people's time. And, you know, uh, thinking about how long these sessions would be to be able to provide a good foundation and um, provide the context without, you know, taking hours of people's precious time. Thanks, Amy. You know, that comes to, that makes me think of another way I was going to suggest for for us to talk about is maybe we pair an education um, component with a public comment component. So they're happening on the same day. I wonder what are your thoughts on that in terms of time commitment and allowing people to absorb the information we're passing on. I mean, my experience here in the capital region is it really depends on on the length of time. You know, um, people are willing to commit a certain amount of time, but it's it's just um, you know it's challenging to commit huge chunks of time. And so, if we're talking like a three or four hour block of time, that that can be very challenging, even though people want to participate and want to be involved in the conversation. So um, I think we just need to think about the time commitment um, and make sure we're taking that into consideration when we're asking community members to uh, participate in these important discussions. All right, and I just Thanks, wanna jump, jump in there. Um, Is that, did I read anybody here because they can't hear anything? So now we can't hear anything. So no, we're having a hard time hearing you. Sometimes if you turn your camera off, it might might make the audio a little clearer. Can you hear me any better? Yes, that's better. Yes. Oh, you can? Okay. Um, I can switch audio if this isn't isn't working, but um, you know my internet's been cutting out. So Rosie, you might have already said this, but um, just you know if we really want to make sure we're bringing in the community members that we're targeting here, we have to have the events you know not within a nine to five weekday hour. Um, so that means week weekday evenings, weekends, um, to make sure we're we're working around people's schedules. Um, and also thinking, maybe we are thinking, you know, very regionally in terms of how we're um, getting feedback. So if we're focusing on certain areas of New York um, State for getting the feedback, then we can get like more specific. We can get a little bit more specific with those areas, and therefore kind of be a little bit more targeted and um, get some more rich feedback from people. Um, uh, and that way, you know, the education setting with the feedback can maybe be paired. More easy in a smaller amount of time if we're if we're kind of splitting a little bit, but then 
you know, we can also talk about the option of, of you know, um, meetings that, that aren't just regional specific, but we should have some um, certainly um, and really make not only just host through or not only host the meeting with people from that region, but really just try to tailor it as much as we can to the specific area we're talking about. Thank you, Sono. Other working group members who haven't had a chance to weigh in? Hi, Rosa. Yes. Hey, hey everybody, this is Joe again. Um, based on some experience I've had uh, with the Department of Labor this past year on a, a farm worker overtime issue, and some things I've seen with some of the other working groups. Um, I guess structurally, I'd suggest that um, we consider, like you guys have spoken about, but doing maybe like a time limit. And, may, may, and if this is obvious, let me know, but like maybe a, a three to four minute time limit for the public, uh, for, for the people to sign up to speak, um, have a queue. I've seen in some situations where they uh, tend to restrict the speakers. I don't think that's a good idea. I think anyone should be able to sign up to discuss it, but within a time frame. Um, and of course, to be able to submit any written materials as they seem appropriate. Uh, and then, of course, prior to the meeting, like we'd have the draft criterion list, I assume, but if there's any other materials, that would be good for them to see, to be able to share that publicly on oh, probably a, a website listing the different times and places where they could sign up for this. Um, I think that would be helpful. Thanks, those, those are great comments. I know from uh, public comment periods that we had to have during COVID that were all virtual, there were a couple of ways we did the structuring also to, to make sure that people could participate even if they didn't have a computer to sign in to a WebEx because that's the system we use. We had call-in options and the way we would organize it is we would ask the callers to give their comment first and then we would pivot to uh, anyone who was logged in that we could see the hands raised and things like that. So there, there's ways we can structure it to do all those sorts of things. I'm interested if anyone else has feedback on what they've heard or, or new thoughts they wanna add to our public engagement. Great, thanks, Jared. I, just noting that he's saying from a rural perspective that it's also helpful to consider those options for communicating uh, with limited internet access. All right, great. Well, if there's no other comments at this time, we can we can pick this up again. What I what I'll propose is that I'll put together um, a proposal of how we could go about the public engagement for you all to respond to in writing and I'll send that around after this meeting so we can continue this and, and get the planning together. Uh, so we're we're going to switch who's doing the slides right now so I can turn this over to Alex and she can show you her PowerPoint. Waiting for the ball thing. You should have it now. Woohoo! Okay. Okay, now I have to figure out how to do this. Share. And I'm going to share this screen. So you guys are going to have a moment of. There we go. Okay. Um, let me just start the presentation and then, of course, switch so that. Okay. Um, as always, please just let it speak up. I can't see the chat thing, so please just speak up or Rosa, let me know if there's someone who wants to chat, if you have questions. Um, what I wanted to do was a couple things. One is I wanted to give you a rundown of where we are in the process, um, talk through some of the updates we have as far as the indicators, because we have data now, um, and like literally hot off the press uh, PDF from last night that I get to show you about some of the indicators, not all of them. Uh, and then we're going to talk about, and I'd really love your feedback on a couple critical areas where 
while we don't have data or models yet, we're really going to need your input on a couple critical decisions coming forward. So I'm going to bring those up as well. Um, where we are in the process. Okay, come on, work for me here. There we are. So uh, this uh, was a graphic that we used very early on in, in some of our presentations to say, okay, well, here's how we're going to do things. We, ha you know, have our objectives, the screening criteria, we've identified which indicators, you know, like out of the 200 plus that we have, which ones we're going to download, um, start exploring the data, the scoring approach for those, and then create the designation or the criteria. Then we've got the evaluate the results and then get to stakeholder public review. The, the interesting part of this is, is frankly, <laughs> Uh, I always promise to be like obvious or honest about what research really looks like. And it looks like this. It doesn't look like beautifully linear. So one of the things that we've had to realize is that there's a lot of loops in prioritization or like understanding where things are. So we've begun the downloads. Um, and now with that error, we're exploring the data now. Um, and then we're going to keep iterating on that as we get new data. Um, <clears throat> and we're we're always going to be getting better data throughout this time period. That's just the way it is. So we're trying to explore the data we have now, recognizing that there might be better things in the future, but some of the things we have are really great. Then quickly following on this exploring the data is really starting to develop, create the combinations of indicators that we think are gonna be the best. Um, test and iterate. So see those really silly loops, like inside a loop and inside a loop, all that? That's going to be critical. We're getting really close to it. What what we're going to be doing next is starting to come up with different kind of combinations and I would say a recipes for you to then look at and ground truth. And, um, you know, I've spoken to a, a lot of you about this, but really I'd love for you all to be thinking about the areas that you know and you represent where you absolutely know this is a this is an area that should be designated. Um, and it's really, really important to look at and make sure that in the models that we present to you that those areas are, are designated that way. Um, and then also, I want you to be thinking of the flip of that too, which is you think they might be designated this, but you really, because you know that community, they're not a disadvantaged community in the same way. Either they've been gentrified or there's something about it that you think it shouldn't be designated. And then testing that flip side too, right? So we're trying to like find the, it's never gonna be perfect, but we're trying to find like the best case scenario. And so those loops are where that happens. We're gonna present with you a bunch, we're gonna come to you and talk to you, and then come up with another one and reiterate, reiterate you know, on that and loop and loop. And then once we get to that point, then we can agree on the criteria the recipe of ingredients and also some of the quantities of those ingredients. Um, so we're quickly moving to that blue loop. Um, and it's kind of funny because that first one is just a huge, huge amount. And then now that we get the data, we actually are going to be able to turn a little faster. So I'm really happy about that. Any questions about my crazy loop-de-loop? -loop? Okay. Um, so I wanted to give you some updates on the indicators and we have good news. Uh, so we kind of identified on a broad spectrum, 124 different indicators that we really, really want to download and start looking at. Um, of those we've downloaded 49. Again, this changes daily. Um, and then we still have some that need to be downloaded. Within the ones that we've downloaded and not yet downloaded are some that need GIS transformations. And from those, what I mean is that, um, say like redlining dist red districts and maps, we're trying to take those and basically put them to the level of measurement that we were, the level of geographic gra gradient that we want. And in that case, we've decided that the best, most granular, smallest, most granular region that we want to work with, very importantly, is the census tract. And so we're trying to take those maps and put the information into a census tract, not census block or census block group. The data are just not good enough at that granular level, and we don't want to go above the tract level. So we want to hit that level and be very careful about it. So here are two things that, Eddie, I think you're going to be happy about this one. Um, we now have almost ready to download. I think actually it is now ready to download as of this morning, the industrial manufacturing sites. 
So I thought you might be really happy about that. <laughs> I saw a yay there. Wait, why am I not getting the other one? Ah, there we go. Yay. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, do the yay. It's good. Uh, that's how we feel every day when we're like trying to track these things down. It's a non-trivial thing trying to get it all. Um, but Redline Communities, school lunches, there are a few other ones um, that are coming in to the GIS transformation. Those are taking longer because they're really hard to kind of transfer, <laughs> transform. Um, but at the same time, we're going to that extra hourly time thing to do that because they're such an important indicators that we think are going to be important at least. So they're worth the effort. Okay. So we have 49 of the 124 that we're working with. And that is really exciting. I don't know if you can tell from my voice. <laughs> uh, it's always exciting when you get finally get to the data set. We're gonna continue downloading the data and then we're gonna make sure that the data are good enough. Um, I'm gonna walk through a document um, in a minute to show you kind of these snapshots of the data we currently have. This document is literally changing every day as we download more information. Um, but I wanted to give you a PDF version of that. Rosa will send it out. Literally, it's just been finished this morning um, so that you can see the examples of what we're working from, and then we'll start adding to it and updating that document as we go so that it will be there and available for you. So. I'm talking fast. Is there any questions? I hear something. Okay. Um, once we've kind of made sure that those are good enough to use now, so some of them, as we download the data, we're like, oh, there's some missing things. Why are those data missing? And then if it's okay that they're missing, then we roll forward, but there might be somewhere like, this is just not good enough. And then we're going to exclude it. But um, <clears throat> we're also going to ask that you just explore those snapshots and take a look at the data that we've done and summarized um, and see you're like, oh, this is super interesting. I never knew that benzene could be so interesting. Um, I never knew, but now it is. So it's cool. We're going to look at it. I would love to get your thoughts on that too. Separately, please feel free to email Rosa Great. with your thoughts on that. The next, anyone? Nope. Okay. The next um, thing that we'll be doing is then doing the the data analysis. This is the part where we're like, well, how do these things work together? This is the the data modeling where we statistically kind of look at how these indicators are clumping together, whether we should kind of aggregate them together, or whether you know theoretically we're also going to do a well. These could talk about air quality, and we're going to choose one or two or the best ones and really push that one forward in our model. And and this is where that hard work that that of creating that recipe of ingredients plus the proportions of the ingredients to make something that's actually real for you to assess. Um, so. We'll explore that and we'll start narrowing that list um, and then giving you examples. And, and again, that those examples, I feel like that's where we've been working really hard to get to and it takes forever to get there. It feels like I'm sure all of you are like, wait, where is that? But that there's a lot going up to that. Once we get to that point, we'll really need you to come in and be like, well, I don't think this recipe of indicators is really getting at what I want, but I think maybe if we did this, we could get it, something like that. And yeah, Eddie, I think that synergistic effect is true, right? You're kind of looking at how things move around together in the combination to get the best set of criteria, so, criteria. to come up with. Alex, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Uh, how are you, um, if, if you're getting the information from the census tract, um, how are you picking up people that are not reflected in the census tract and how are you distinguishing between people? Because as I mentioned at one of our previous meetings, that term Hispanic is a very misleading term. It's too generic and it doesn't tell the story of different groups and it's, it, it doesn't work. Um, and so I, I, if there are undocumented people, people who just don't show up, how, how do you mm -hmm. get that information? 
I think the way that I want to get at that information is, is by trying at multiple angles with multiple data points, not everything coming from census, but like other points to try to get at that. And I'll show you a combination of things that, that we're seeing in the data that, that might help show you what I mean. Um, and to the point about race and ethnicity, I totally get it. And in fact, you know, when we think of the indicator of race and ethnicity within, um, all of this, we're actually going to be downloading a ton of information and trying out different parts. So it's not just like the general generic bin of people of color or just Latino or Hispanic that we're going to be focused on, but rather different combinations within that or subgroups because we have some of those data from census. I hear you okay. though of the um, concern you have about census tracts not picking up certain things, a uh, certain people, certain groups and i think that that's where i'll need your help to kind of assess are we missing a component that you really think is is there that we're not measuring um to me what i'm hoping to do is that we layer on multiple variables multiple data points and that we get there if indirectly right there's no one golden solution of one indicator or even 10 that's going to get us there. But if we are thoughtfully applying things, um, then I'm hoping what we do is we get close enough. I, I think that in this process, you're going to have to document and even name the fact that the way that the information is being collected is insufficient. Um, mm -hmm. And that the reason that we can't get to uh, the root of some of these problems is because the information, the way that the data is collected is insufficient. I think that's an important message uh, in governance uh, mm -hmm. for governance to start moving away from these generic terms that really don't tell people stories because, uh, you know, the truth, the reality is that you can be German, you could be French, you could be Italian. But if you're a Puerto Rican, you're supposed to be a Hispanic. And so, um, and so while there is a lot uh, for people of European ancestry to distinguish difference with us, we're just sort of lumped in a category that doesn't tell our story, what the needs of our communities are, and they're all different. And so we need to start moving away from that. And that is not going to happen unless someone who's doing this work for a state agency says, listen, we can't collect information this way anymore. We need to do better than that. Um, so yeah. I, I would just ask that you do that. Um, and then of course we will give you input, but, uh, you, we're going to have to be bold in challenging the way that these constructs were created. I am all there with you considering my background as an Argentine Latina who is white also, like I'm not captured in that. And I don't feel, you know, so we can, we can have a conversation about that. I think we should absolutely document it um, and talk through what that really is going to mean and entail and assess the implications of what data we have and where it's missing. So I think that that's another component to it. So it's not just documenting, but also like on the flip side, where are we missing those, those critical components? And like, what can we then recommend as better data collection efforts in the, in the long run? I think is vital. Amanda, I know you wanted to chime in, so. I do, I think these are great points and there's so many limitations to a lot of these variables. I mean, you mentioned um, a lot of the limitations of census data. There's also statistical limitations in that, you know, the census data reflects one point in time. It's not super recent for all the granular stuff we need. So there's limitations there. There's also limitations in a lot of the variables that we use from the census are sampled. They're never, census counts everyone, but they don't really look at race and ethnicity. So even if it were collected perfectly, there's still a lot of other, um, you know, considerations for that variable. Similarly, every variable has has some considerations. So I think there, in addition to what Alex said, is, is looking at things from multiple angel angles, we also have to be careful of how much weight we give to things that we have doubts about. So if we really don't think the census is the be all end all, then maybe we don't give 50% weight to those in the demographics part or something like that. So just being careful of, yeah, I agree, like really knowing the limitations and being careful that we're not saying, oh, just because this variable says percent Hispanic, it really reflects that and using it a lot. Um, to the question of like what other information we have, just as like one idea for triangulation, um, we're working with um, the Department of Health to get 
um, you know, we have asthma and COPD visits and hospitalization, you know, re rates related to where people live. So those could reflect um, different people. And then also working on getting um, low birth weight and um, premature um, deaths, premature mortality. So again, those are just some examples from the health perspective. There's other ways we have to look at population, but I agree there's no perfect way and there's measurement error in a lot of things. So Elizabeth, I want to just build on that and say it is incumbent upon us at, to document all of this and to be very clear of what's what's um, missing and, and not. And I, I also, because we have the chance to, I think it's good for us to then give recommendations of how it can be better measured. Um, and what data we can collect. To that end, I think also, um, given the infection rates for COVID-19, we don't have those data yet. We, we're not gonna get them for this iteration of it, but it's something that we actually want and have on the list of things you really need to consider because that also can indirectly give us some really interesting data um, to highlight specific communities that are more at risk. So I think, you know, to that end, I hear you. Let's keep talking about it because I think it's bring it up every time. Um, but I will also make note and make sure that we are documenting it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so this is, you know, these are the next steps and. As I said, as we're downloading data, you know, we're not quite halfway through with that, but we're we're starting to to try to come up with our ingredients and recipes and start modeling things. Um, and we'll build things in as we go to the point of really knowing that it's just not fair on you guys to look at giant Excel sheets of hundreds of different indicators and be like, tell us what you want, but rather you know, here are some maps or here are some areas that we are designating in this recipe iteration set of criteria <laughs> versus this one. And then you can really react to it. And I think that's when the, the debate's going to happen. And I think that's when you all will feel like, yeah, I got something I to say now. Um, and so we're building toward that. It's just taking a while to track down the data. OK, um, I wanted to go now to the indicator snapshot document. Um, and it's so cool. It's still still a work in progress, but let's get there. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. You all will be getting this beautiful document, which basically just starts with a bunch of data um, and you can jump to different ones here. These are the different indicators we have. They're ordered in such a way to hit pillar one, then pillar two, then pillar three. And in them, I'm just going to choose benzene because I told you it was super interesting, evidently. Totally interesting to me, at least. Um, <clears throat> okay, air quality indicator. What we have is the name of the, the real name of whatever the indicator is. The variable name, this is for us internally. What pillar it's trying to address. What factor or concept we're trying to get at with it. And then a little bit of a definition of the metric of it. Um, and that's where the kind of the that's that's the the detail um, that we're trying to like measure it as. And then it's here for us. We're trying to assess oh the data, data sufficiency, like how many things are missing, how many zero values we have. The reason we do this is that it's okay to have missing values. It's okay to have zero values. There's various reasons for that. Um, and but what we don't want is to have thousands in here. So 48 missing values is totally okay, but it, it gives us enough to understand things. Then we go to a histogram, brief review of histograms, the beautiful things that they are, is basically you're taking the measurement that you have. So in this case, you're having something that's close to zero on um, information or data for that benzene count all the way up to like, well, less than 1.25, whatever metric that is. What you do is in the data you have those 4,000 data points we have, you just add up how many are 0.25, how many are 0.5, and you go along the line there and you create this visual. What statisticians look at in the in this, they're looking to see, well, what do the data look like? How do they break down? 
when I see this document, I'm like, ha, huh, there's a lot of people who have a lower measurement of benzene, and there's a lot of areas, I should say census tracts, that have a higher one. And in, in our world, this is bimodal. And I'm like, oh, bimodal, that's cool. Why? And here's why. So what we started to do is say, a lot of the things that we know are based on geography, or at least some of these critical um, indicators are geographically based. There's higher ones in New York City versus rural. Sometimes it's both, sometimes it isn't, but we need to assess that. So what we wanna look at is of the top 25% highest scores, where are they residing? Um, and so we're looking at that. Oh, well, 99% of those scores, the top 25% of the scores are in New York City. And, and you can see that in this now color-coded New York City versus the rest of the state histogram. Amanda, did you wanna say something or are you good? You're muted, you're muted. New York City in this document and our, our work isn't just, um, it's the New York City Regional Economic Development Region, so it's all five counties. Yeah, thanks. So in this case, we can see the definition, or we can see that the the curve is is really geographically kind of dispersed, or the the reasoning for it. Um, same exact data. It's just now we've color coded the counts for different places here. Then we started to try to break this down a little bit more as well. Um, for all of these, there's now then a breakdown of the top 25% by economic development region. And for some of these, this actually breaks down into the many, many more geographic regions. Um, but it also just tells us the top ones. So it's like counting the top 25 and then it will list out in a percentage what those are. So in this case, well, Mid Hudson and New York City are the places where this is really hitting. <clears throat> um, there was also some discussion about the urban, suburban, rural, breakdown of things because that is a possibility for us to be thinking about geographically whether we set definitions for New York City versus the rest of the state. Do we set it by urban, rural, suburban, or do we try to create something that is ubiquitous across everything, uh, all of New York? Um, so we're trying to understand that and we give those breakdowns as well as far as ur urban and rural, um, urban, suburban, and rural. And then we have a box plot. Box plot, much like a histogram, tells you the shape of the data um, that you're getting. This middle box right here is the middle 50%, like where do most of the data lie? So if you think of that histogram, you kind of like plop it on the end and like the bulk of it is in that box. And it's really useful sometimes to just look at, okay, well, that's, that's a box, and that's very different, that box, from this box in suburban versus rural. And so it can be really helpful for us to understand the shape of the distribution just by boxes in this way. The dots are like extreme values, um, and then you've got the up part, which is the top 25%, the bottom 25%, middle 50% here. Um, <clears throat> and so that really helps you to get a sense of what it looks like without having to like do crazy amount of plots either way. And for me, as I'm looking at the data and for when Amanda's looking at the data, what we're looking at is like, huh, that's interesting. There's urban, which, you know, a lot of New York City is gonna be this, but then there's other urban areas, other suburban areas. How do these work together and function? Um, what do they look like and how do they distribute? Any questions so far? Because I'm throwing like statistical jargon at you and I don't want to just gr gloss over the fact that that's not always the simplest thing. Okay. I'm going to be really honest to say that um, I'm definitely in a learning posture. It feels like new language, which is fine. I love that it's visual, but it doesn't have a narrative to go along with that. Mm -hmm. um, I assume that we will get there. Um, so I think that's why I'm not saying anything, but I'm finding this to be incredibly fascinating. <laughs> well, um, 
speaking of someone who used to teach and love teaching research methods and statistics at the college level, just whap me over the head if I'm going too fast, okay? But yeah, this is highly technical, um, but it's also like, what I really want is to open the doors of what we're considering and looking at, because these are critical things that we're assessing and looking at. And it's important that that even though we're talking about formaldehyde here or benzene or whatever, that you all know what we see when we see this. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, it's, it's basically just trying to differentiate and understand where the differences are coming from. So we know some are going to be regional, we know some are not. And so this is like trying to build the story, right? But the story cannot be only told in benzene. It has to be told with, you know, education and car ownership and rent burden. And so how do those mix together? That's the next part of what we're talking about. Can I also ask, uh, and I'm, and, you know, I'm fascinated, right? Like, I'm like, I, I wasn't even going to come on this call because I wasn't feeling well. And I'm like, I'm totally geeking out. Um, <laughs> Ralph, I'm geeking out. <laughs> so, um, do you also, um, maybe this is not even the right question or the right place to do this, but while you're looking at those things together, are you also looking at the combination of benzene and other kinds of things together and what those result in. So, for example, you know, we in the environmental justice movement, we talk in, in climate, people talk about carbon and in EJ, we talk about co-pollutants. So what happens when you bring together a variety of co-pollutants in terms of how they interact with each other and result in disease? Does that, will we have graphics that tell that story as well? Yes, um, to a certain degree, yes. And um, so I don't want to like overwhelm you with the, this idea of things, but I can actually show you because I just did it. Um, we're doing this this analysis right now. You're going to see this output, which is just a bunch of numbers. But what I did was actually look at in combination, how do these things combine together? What we're missing here is then that assessment part that is the equally valuable, right? This is just like, how do these correlate together? Well, the COP DED and the COP DH and the hospitalization visits basically, the, you know, um, go together. And then the asthma ED, like these things clump together. And it's that combination that can then tell that story, which is Elizabeth, what you're talking about, right? But we're at the very early stages of that. But it is something that we're going to be looking at. And in fact, one of the next things we'll be talking about are um, the correlations, which is like, how do they meld together? How are they related? But what you're asking, I think, is actually a, a deeper question, which is like, how then do they tell the story of, of something more unique? Like in combination, is it a deeper story than just one part together? Is that, am I interpreting you right, Elizabeth? I, I, Yes, I mean, I, I guess I would have I would have uh, articulated it a little different. Uh, but for example, you've got a community that's living in the midst of um, of uh, a number of co pollutants, and mm -hmm. how do you connect? How do you connect their health disparities to the combination of those, um, and then their susceptibility to disease as a result of being. Uh, in a place that may be uh, susceptible to extreme weather events, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that understanding that uh, will also help us understand what the interventions need to be, right? Uh, for example, here in Sunset Park, against our advice, uh, the board, the Department of Education decided to put a school, a, pre uh, a, a, a primary school uh, in the industrial sector, right in the middle of brownfields, right? Uh, because they can, of course, clean up the brownfield, but they can't control fugitive dust and other chemicals that will be dispersed as a result of extreme weather events. So you take a child and a child who has comes from a family that may have had a history of asthma, of a respiratory disease, and you put them in the middle of that toxic soup. So what happens there? So mm -hmm. I think I think the science can really create uh, the scenarios for us to engage in the right interventions and mm -hmm. and prevent us from planning and building in a way that is harmful. And and I guess that's what I'm getting at. I'm sorry for being long winded about it, but I don't. This 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 is new for me, and I'm just trying to from my from where I'm at, try to describe how it could be useful. Yeah. Well, 
I think what you just described to me on a statistical way is talking about an interaction effect, right? So if you have, and Amanda's going to want to talk in a minute because because she's going to want to talk about this, but or other areas of this, um, you have something like benzene, you have you know the brown sites, you have other things. It's almost like each of those individually can be dealt with, or if you look at them in a silo, they're fine, right? They're fine, not fine, but they're fine. The moment you put them together, it's like baking soda and vinegar, they like blow up. And I think that's what you're talking about, which is in, in statistical terms, that's an interaction, right? So you have this going this way, and then all of a sudden you add something else and it's like, Pink! and then it's like, that's what we're trying to get at. And so when I talk about the combinations, what I'm trying to find is the story and the data that will get us to that point where we can really highlight this is the exacerbated risk, taking all of those components together. So yes, we're going to look at it, but at the same time, I can say that statistically we're going to do it, but we could, again, the, the data is only good enough from what we know about it, what we can extract and how well it's measured. And so that's where having that sense of of you being able to ground truth whatever we come up with based on the data we have is going to be vital so that you can be like, no, this place, it's bad here and we know it and it's not showing up with your recipe of combination of things. How do we make it so that shows up while in rural New York, we make other places show up as well and it's hard, but that's where we need to go. Hey, Alex, Eddie also has a, a question. Okay. Hey, Alex, and, and this this may actually be more for well, I think it's probably information for for uh, Alum and uh, and DEC, but um, we, we, I, I I've, I've gotten different senses about sensibilities or senses about at what point the climate justice working groups task is done, and then what happened. I, I've been I've been proceeding all along thinking our task is to come up with the indicators and the methodology for application. Whenever, so in the future, as communities are looked at, there's a transparent and 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 um, uh, useful and sensible tool to to to, to arrive at those uh, classifications, right? We're not going like this. The, the, I don't know if the intention is for us to actually map the entire state of New York. I I'm, I haven't seen it in a long time. I keep hearing that. Uh, Cal and Viral Screen actually does that in California, right? They actually have uh, a statewide map that actually identifies what's an EV community and what's not. Um, so clearly, we're not, you know, if, if our job as a working group ends in a month or two, um, you know, that's not going to get done. That'll get done way after we're done, right? Um, what I'm what I'm a little worried about is. Um, how people, and I guess is less of, maybe more of a comment, less of a question. The first question is like, does the state have any sense of when, once this is settled, when, or if a New York statewide map of disadvantaged communities is actually gonna be on, on a website somewhere? Um, if there is, or even if there isn't, um, what I see happening here, and, and thank you so much for this, Alex, like it, it, I'm, I'm with Rawa, like I'm following this, from a distance, but I'm following it. Uh, I, 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 it's just fascinating. It's, it's totally right. But I also see the possibility of people, because of how sophisticated the synergies of, of all the indicators and what Elizabeth is is, is 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 reaching is the real impacts of all this stuff, right? What I worry about is um, the average New Yorker not understanding that that is going to be central to how we identify communities. It's not just going to be even, you know, the, the rich set of indicators that, that we're going to arrive at. So I, I guess it's my pitch, or I don't know if you guys have given any thought to it, but it's, I think in order to make sure that there's public confidence in the tool and the ultimate application of the tool, there's going to need to be some explanation of this. Like, and how do you explain this in layman's terms? Alex, I mean, sign up for one of your classes is all I'm saying. You know what I mean? But that, yeah. that's going to be a big part of this. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, I'm totally there with you. It's it's really hard. And, and one of the things that we've been struggling with, honestly, is trying to figure out how to catalog every single decision that we've made, right? So, like, 
yes, we have this giant Excel sheet and yeah, now we're downloading gigabytes worth of data and now we're doing this kind of stuff with it. Um, and, and I think also the layer that is really hard to talk about is not just the fact that that this is a statistical exercise for us because it can't be like, uh, as we mentioned before, none of us are experts on any any one thing, right? Like I'm looking at benzene going, hey, that's cool. Never seen it before. What? <laughs> right. But um, so that's why we're asking you and, and the experts that you can tap into to be able to inform some of this. Um, so, because it is really, really hard to try to articulate all of this, we're gonna. I, I, there's no I, way that. I, yeah, I, go I, one follow up, and 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 what I don't think anyone's mentioned this, but you know, we don't. As far as I know, this working group, we don't have a public health professional anywhere in this mix with us, right? Like, we're, we're you know the kind of uh, impacts that Elizabeth is talking about. You mm -hmm. know, we're we're gonna need that, and that that's like a key missing component of the working group, but more importantly, like how is the Department of Health going to be working with DEC to do the kind of medical impact that I think you're 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 touching on, Alex, and that Elizabeth was was touching on. And, and this has been an ongoing problem in EJ for for decades. We've always been like, you know, DEC is there. We can always talk to DEC. Where's health? Sorry, sorry. Right. So Eddie, no. I wanted to answer a couple of your questions. Um for the first one, you know, on this particular work group, Department of Health is, we do have a meal from Department of Health here, but we also have the state staff team that is helping us understand all this data that Alex is working with. So, for example, you know, from DEC Air, they're helping us understand the benzene information and things like that. So, putting that out there, and then I think you had a question about this working group and where does it end? <laughs> I just wanted to note that the legislation does recognize mean, Rosa, that this it, it, group should we be. We love you guys. You know, Don't get me wrong. I know. <laughs> it, 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 the legislation does recognize that this group should meet at least once a year after the initial creation uh, or you know establishing the criteria, so that we can learn from the experience with the criteria and fine tune as needed. So I just wanted to you know answer that part of your question as well. And I think I interrupted Amanda. Um, I think you and Alex have both covered what I was thinking, and it is, you know, I think, as Alex said, this is not just a statistical exercise, and we really need um, expertise from DEC, environmental corners, and health. Um, you know, this first pillar says areas burdened by cumulative environmental pollution and other hazards that can lead to negative public health effects. Um, how California got to their list of 21 things of all the things we're already at 49. We want, you know, 124 have been listed. We can't put something out with 124 things in it. No one could possibly understand it or review it. And the way they called things down is say, look, we're only really going to include pollution burdens and threats that have been linked and have documented evidence of negative public health effects. So we certainly need to go through this list and get more people to weigh in, you know, especially for pillar one. What really is causing that? And I think how, you know, how we got benzene and formaldehyde on the list was reaching out to the DEC and really showing them this legislation saying, really, what are of all the chemicals you have that you track, which are way more than listed here, what do you think the core ones? And we're gonna have to keep doing that and say, okay, well, now we have 15 things on the list to represent this thing. How do we narrow that down? Um, and at the same, I mean, now that this resource is out there, we would certainly love other perspectives on what are the most critical things that have been linked to the effects we're trying to um, mitigate. Yep. So to build on that, um, I think we would love your expertise. I should note that Amanda and our analysts have been meeting uh, with multiple hours every week with different uh, experts to try to call this down and to try to identify different parts. That doesn't mean that we don't feel like we still need more expertise. So please bring that if you have it. Um, we recognize also that your research constrained and time constrained. So what we're trying to do is find that middle ground of, of asking, inviting, but also seeking out ourselves. So we're definitely getting that health perspective, but <laughs> we always want more. Um, Eddie, I think you still have some stuff to say. 
but sorry, the last question was whether the intent is to publish a statewide map of disadvantaged communities at some point, or is this a tool that will be mostly used by regulators to assess whether it's permit conditions or funding or, yeah. So if we if we come up with a, a criterion list, um, if we are in a position to publish a California style map, it would be public. It, it wouldn't be just something that we would hide and keep to ourselves. And I did want to note that Sonal is next with the question. If if Eddie, you're you're set with your questions. Thanks, Rosa. Um, hopefully, I'm not taking us back too many steps, or maybe there's an easy answer to this, but. Have we discussed the possibility of using some indicators in some areas of New York State and some indicators in other <laughs> areas of New York State? Oh my goodness, Sotal, you're like a plant. Uh, <laughs> so that was okay. awesome. Um, <laughs> I'm going to table that because, like, I think we might have a couple more minutes of talking about this, but then that we'll go right into that. This is why I've been using the um, annoying, and I know I keep. Uh, oh, what's the word? Leaning on on really silly metaphors like recipes and ingredients and and proportions of those ingredients. Um, but there's a reason for it, and part of it is exactly what you're talking about. We're gonna bake a cake with gluten free flour in one place, and you know, gluten full flour in another. It's a valid question. You all ready for the next installment of Stats 101? Hey, Alex, I yeah. wanted to jump in really quick and mention we're happy to, as we have been, um, you know, talking to you about how we can assist in providing health data, we're happy to try to answer some of those questions about, um, you know, you know can I, can I health that some of these things have, which would also include probably our perspective on, you know, the strengths and limitations of data sets that, that you've talked about as well. Um, but that said, it's been interesting. This I was interested to ask you a detailed question about how you split out urbanicity, but um, we could probably talk about that another time if you want to move on. Uh, sure, right. and, and I'm, but but I do think we should we should uh, tackle some of that. I also think that we can talk through uh, and actually have you talk through some of your expertise with some of these health indicators as well. So one of the things that we could do is more information share and bring other people up to snuff like. I don't know about benzene. I have made that perfectly clear here, but um, but I think that having your perspective um, and showing some of the things that we've talked about, like you and Amanda have talked about in depth, um, I think might be benefit for the working group generally. So at some point, let's do that. Okay, you've avoided it long enough, but we're gonna talk about correlations now. <clears throat> If you were going to say something like what's related to what, and we talk about correlations often, you know, people say, well, this is related to this, or this leads to that. Um, correlations are not causal. Um, so this doesn't lead to this. We don't have that kind of perspective with these, this statistic, but what we're trying to say here is how much does the information about formaldehyde overlap with the information we have about benzene? And so that means like in a census tract, we have this proportion of of benzene particulate matter, whatever it is, right? And then you have this metric for benzene in this census tract. You have another metric here for formaldehyde of measurement here and in census tract A. How related is that to, you know, that proportion, that difference of like 1.5 for formaldehyde and 10 point whatever for benzene? Now I'm flipping the scales, I'm sorry. But that relationship, that how closely aligned are they? Right. If you have a lot of formaldehyde in one census tract and you have a lot of benzene measurement in one census tract versus low and low for another census tract, that's a correlation. That means they're related to one another. And that's what we're trying to measure here. And when you look at the numbers like this, they vary from zero to one. And, um, Really high numbers like 98 is like obscenely correlated. Statistically speaking, that's really high. Um, and then in in my world of social science, you usually see things like 0.3 or 0.4 and you dance for joy. 
some of these are so high, you're like, wow, okay. Obviously these air quality indicators relate to one another. And so they're giving us almost all the same amount of information. This gives us a lot of choices of what to do with the data. Um, but it's also really fun because what we started looking at is, okay, we have this benzene measurement. We know that the top three things that it's related to are formaldehyde particulate matter and the diesel particulate matter. Awesome. But if you go down to how, what are they related to with pillar two, the, the indicators we have for pillar two? Well, they're related to nativity and English spoken at home. Elizabeth, now I'm gonna bring in that whole idea here of the fact that this can also be something that can indirectly get us at other places, right? So benzene can tell us that you're living in an area with high nativity, or like of the United States or English spoken at home um, or people of color. And so that gives us a bigger picture, an understanding of what's going on in that census tract versus another. So that's really interesting. It's also related to car ownership. Um, and then you've got food deserts and heating fuel, not as related, but it's interesting. So this is the, the last part of the document for each pillar or for each indicator that we have. And for us, this tells us a ton of information. Um, and it's, I think as you go through and you start looking at like something like asthma ED rates and you start looking at how things break down, it will give you a little bit more information. Um, and so that's why we wanted to share this with you so that you can tinker around with it. I'm also giving you an open uh, invitation to email me and be like, what do you mean by R, that correlation statistic, or what do you mean by percent of the top 25%, which I absolutely adhor when you have two percentage things in a, in a label, but that's where we're at. So you can always email me about those and be like, I don't understand this. Please explain it and I will be there. Any questions about this before we go back and start talking about some uh, things that now we can talk about? Anything else here? Very I, cool, Alex. I've got one thing. Bring it. Um, and, and apologies, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure about the answer to this. I'm gonna drop this in, in, in the chat, but um, we, we just did a study, Nija just did a study um, that where we did our own air quality testing um, and we found uh, then part in some of our EJ neighborhoods that the air, and what we did was we did local, hyper-local air quality testing with handheld devices at the street level. Um, and it showed, and, it's probably, and I don't think it's a surprise to DEC, DEC actually uh, uh, shared a, a, a helpful comment about this study and the story that I'll also share, but um, we found that uh, the, the our portable hyperlocal air quality testing showed PM 2.5 emissions 20 times higher than what the state's air quality monitoring network shows. And, and some of it is just the nature of the beast, right? Like the air monitor mm -hmm. the state uses is, I don't know, 20 feet above, 15 feet above street, or whatever the, but it's, 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 it's not where people are breathing, right? Uh, and and it's averaged over like a three day period. So it's not the air quality monitoring system uh, is just it, it, from our perspective, it appears to be fatally flawed. Um, I don't know what to do about that when I know the government has to rethink how they do air quality testing period. But I'm just wondering, um, is there an opportunity for if there's local air quality testing or for example the city of new york has its own uh air quality testing network uh that's that's much more than what the state has and i think at a lower level as well is and this is probably less of a question for a little more for dec but is there a way for you know different air quality measurements to be incorporated in this analysis and maybe not but i'm just you, you see the problem let me just drop the, the report and study yeah and drop the report that. Betty. So, so I think the answer is yes. We, we, uh, if you, if you know of the uh, Albany South end study, it's a kind of a good example um, where we had sort of the, one of those fixed monitors telling us generally what was being experienced in the South end of Albany. 
that was very generic information, not very helpful real time. So what we did is, is it was a very intensive uh, community level survey where we, um, we had a fixed station monitor right at uh, Ezra Prentice Homes in the South End, we coupled that with backpack monitoring devices where we get interns from, from, uh, from the neighborhood, basically walking the street uh, several hundred miles worth of walking and that gave us this real time um, picture of what was happening. Plus, we had a camera and sound meters on the street. Wow. So we got to the point where we could tell literally what fleets were responsible for excess emissions at a particular time of day. That enabled us to go work with the fleets to begin scaling down those emissions. So it is very possible, but it was incredibly time intensive. And that's what we learned. Um, so we have the CLCPA, which requires new monitoring approach uh, next year, something we're working on right now. Uh, I won't get into the specifics. I'm, I'm not sure what direction it's going to go, but I, I think we recognize that we need to modernize the system that we have, and that's going to ultimately benefit all the work we're doing here. Yeah, from a methodological perspective, I want to make sure um, that what what we're comparing when we have those data is apples to apples across you know different places, and so that's the only pause I have is if you have better resolution data, and if we can get it, that's good. But we want to make sure that it's equal across the different places that we're going. So that to me is the the part where I think what we need to think about with this always is that it's a work in progress, right? Just like with the COVID-19 data, we want to get that eventually. We think it will actually be very informative for something longer, but that's next year. Mm -hmm. um, hence what Rosa said, which is basically like, we need to assess this long term to see, is this tool still working for us? Because uh, I also have a feeling that the 2020 census data are not going to be nearly as good as what we've had in the past, given many things that happened last year. So, you know, those are things that we're going to have to be keeping thought on throughout this process. Amanda, did you want to add? Yeah, I just want to add, you know, what, what we're really using here is not the actual values that someplace has, you know, 400 um, PM 2.2. 0.25 parts per million, but the relative order of communities. So um, if something has measurement error of 20 times something, um, you know, what we're really looking at is the whole distribution. So as long as everything is measured the same way and, and we can use the overall, you know, we're probably like those specific values don't matter as much as how communities kind of line up and how they're distributed. So using state, we're kind of focused on using statewide data for this round, assuming we need to compare all the communities in the state. Okay. Good question. I'm going to move us on, but I also wanted to show you, we have, you know, we talked about benzene because I don't know, I was just kind of shocked and I thought that the histogram was awesome. But we do have some other really important ones going down from pillar one and pillar two. And um, I ask all of you to take a look at this um, and see what you think. I think there's a lot of data and information in here that can be informative. It's certainly informing us and in how we're going to look at things. Okay. Yep. Did someone it's, want to say something? I could tell someone's dying to say something. Nope. Okay. Why is this not wanting to? Okay. Um, I'm just going to question. Sorry. The, can you go yeah. back to that page just really quickly? Totally. Let me find it. Okay. There we go. Let me know what the, the Y axis is. So that's the histogram. It's just the count. So it's like oh, the okay. frequency of that measurement. So in this case, like it goes from zero to one. So this is the proportion in that census tract that own a, a car. Um, so in this case, you know, rest of state, or I think this is backward, actually, this is negatively done. So um, I'll have to check and we'll add that in here. Okay. It's, it's the you. percent of people without a vehicle yeah. is, yeah, with no yeah. vehicle. Yeah. Percent, percent of people with no vehicle. And so what we're getting here is the percent of people without a vehicle. 
Um, and then, so it's kind of like saying, well, 800 people, or there's 800 census tracts where uh, the percent is very low, is the better way of putting it. This is the thing about statistics. It's so like annoyingly nitpicky as far as the definition of what this is, but I would urge you also not to get too caught up in the details of those things other than look at the shapes, look at what this is telling us um, about the data. And, um, and then also like where the data are, the top 25% to me, yeah, New York City figures highly in here, but it's not everything. That's good. I want some indicators that are differentiating, not just between the rest of the state and New York City. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we're gonna get into some meaty things and I do wanna say there are really no right answers on this, um, but there are some critical decisions that we're gonna have to make. And um, we're not gonna make it now, but I want you all to be thinking about this because it's gonna come up really fast. So I know you had just brought it up and it's kind of awesome that you were talking about it. Um, we need to, at some point, make a decision about regional splits. Like, and I'm going to go through an example to, to explain this, but I do want to say our choices here are really going to matter. And this is not something that, um, like, should just be data driven. We need to actually make a, a decision that's going to help inform, you know, policy. Yeah. And so this is, this is where we really need your thought, thoughts on it and opinions. And I have a feeling they're going to differ. So. I wanted to bring it up now so that when we give you examples, you'll see what we mean. I'm going to take the interim DAC approach and, and kind of talk through what this is, and then I'll open it up for questions once I've talked through it because it's not always easy to explain. So just assume this is just the measurement we're going to take. If we use the interim DAC criteria, that approach, um, we would get this kind of map where the the highlighted areas are considered a disadvantaged community. Now, if we take those data and we start looking at them and we break it down by the percent of the population versus what we've designated as a DAC, how does that break down? Well, if you look at New York City, it's 43-ish percent of the population in New York, in New York State, but it's 69 percent, so over two-thirds of the percent of the designated areas are in New York City. That's just kind of like as it goes with that very simple interim designation. And if we break it down even further, again, because people have been interested in this urban, suburban, rural breakdown, half of the New York, uh, New York State population is in, resides in an urban area designated area, but 78% of the those areas that are designated to be a, di a disadvantaged community, there's over three quarters of them that are that are urban. So then there's like that disconnect, right? So more urban areas are disadvantaged according to the way that this is broken down. That could be a totally viable, fine thing to do, but I also want to recognize that you all might have different opinions. What I just described is a data-driven approach, right? We didn't fix or what, what we would call in fancy stats land, like we didn't stratify and say, we're gonna create a designation and a, like just have 25% of, of people in the rural areas have a designation for DACs. And then for urban, it will be 25% and suburban, it will be 25% or New York City and the rest of the state. We didn't do that right now, but we could. Um, we could also come up with something in the middle. And I think Sonal, you were the one that said, were saying, well, could we have different indicators for different areas? That's one way to get around this because there's some things that we could do that say, well, you know, for rural areas, we're gonna have this recipe to make cake. Again, this is the gluten-free, not gluten-free thing. So this is something that I know I'm bringing to you in a highly theoretical way, which is kind of annoying, right? Because I'm not giving you maps or data to react to, but I also want to bring it up now because when you start looking at the data, it's gonna be really vital for us to get your opinion um, 
and it can't just be done by us. This is one of those critical areas. We need your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Please share your opinions now. So Alex, this is Rosa. Can you explain what you mean by 25% New York City, 25% that, that line, the second one? Yeah, so let me take you back to this pretty picture. So what we would then do is basically say for the urban area, 25% of the urban area can be designated uh, DAC, 25 of suburban areas would be designated DAC, 25% of the rural areas would be designated DAC. And it will, it would really be making these bars equal to say that equal shares of um, census tracts in each area are designated as DAC. So the gray bars would be equal to the blue bars. Um, Good addition. Say. Yeah. So it's one way to think about it that, you know, we have our, our indicators. So would it be that the top quartile in the New York City census tracts? And then you would move to suburban census track and take the top quartile there. So it's still it's still the quartiles that are the most impacted, if that's the right language. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. So it's just not comparing suburban to urban. Okay. Right. No, and and so what I'm going to do here is overlay. Forgive my it, it, it's imperfection here, but overlay what Amanda was saying is like so the 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 top 25% of urban areas would then be designated. So then you would have this proportional thing where the, um, rather than having kind of a more lopsided view, which is what we've had, it would be more like this, et cetera. And there are many ways to do this. So we could do this by having one big score for everyone, but then once we have the scores, breaking it out and having equal slices of each, you could also have totally separate scoring systems so that certain areas have totally different variables or different weighting. And we're not asking here at all what what the methodology behind it should be, but rather what you what looks like a fair and equitable um, at the end. Like if if the end result of our scoring looks something like um, these charts on this um, these last two charts, would that look right to you and then if it if it doesn't look quite right you know do you do we want to do something to um to fix or direct the way it looks a little bit more and then we figure out what that approach could be Brooks, do you want to show the previous slide too yeah i'll put yeah. the the previous one which might be easier for people to mm -hmm. to Good. But I, I do want to say again, like, I recognize that this is really hard to think of through theoretically. And I think that when we give you scenarios, we'll give you ones where it's like, here's where the data lie, just no matter what, here's the breakdown, you know, ground truth, your areas, just like we're asking you to do. Right. Um, but then we'll give you different scenarios or like, well, this is where we've imposed that idea of like equal share across the different key regions. Um, and then we'll do some kind of combination. And this is a, a tweakable place, like a place where we have to, to kind of impose our perspective or your perspective based on what you know and what you think is the most equitable. So I think okay. there, Amy was uh, asking about an example, and I think an example would help a lot of us who are not as familiar with this kind of work understand it. Uh, so I know you wanted to preview this because it's some it's a decision point, right? And we want to make sure yeah. everybody is is up to speed to make that decision. So maybe what we should do is come up with some examples that would help us under you know some yeah. means in practice. I totally agree, and I want that to happen. I'm gonna do some Venn diagrams. Please forgive me. This may just not help, but it might. And so if it does, that's great. If it doesn't. It just but can we, Eddie had another, oh, Sonal had a question. Can we just go to number 17 so we can add um, slide 17 and, and address Sonal's question? Sure. She asked what percent of the New York state population lives in New York City. Um, 43%. Which, so, yeah, so what is this show, what this is showing is the blue is the percentage. Um, 
The blue is the percentage of people that re that reside in New York City as opposed to um, outside of the population. Actually, let me just. So this is showing forty three percent of the state of the statewide population lives in New York City, but then the other blue is showing that of yeah, all this the is... population in DAC, sixty nine percent of the DAC population is in New York City, mm -hmm. and then of the 57% of the population that lives in the rest of New York state, um, only 31% of that rest of New York state population is in, is in the communities designated as disadvantaged. Yeah, and I'm sorry, the, the graphs are flipped across the two. So of course you're having a hard time yeah. seeing the, this. Um, so let me, I can't fix it in here, but basically what you want to think of here, again, this is the messy technical part of statistics that's just annoying sometimes. So 43% of the population live in New York City. 69% of the designation of, you know, for disadvantaged communities live in New York City. So uh -huh. it's it's weighted toward this. Um, and so this kind of is fine. Again, I want to to iterate that it's really important to recognize that this is a perfectly okay thing to happen. This is the data driven approach where it's just basically like this is what you get. But I also know that we have stakeholders here, um, committee members, working group members who want to make sure that their areas are represented. And so if that's the case, then we need to be thinking about this. And again, a working example of this is coming up. Theoretically, this is so hard to talk through and I get it, but I want to talk through it using Venn diagrams because because that's where we're at. Um, okay. If we're talking about this is New York City. And then we're talking about who gets designated as a DAC. This is what you would see as opposed to outside of New York City. If you think of it this way, it's a slightly bigger circle to start with, but it's a smaller circle that get designated DAC. DAC. Uh -huh. And again, that looks like a weird Elmo I just thing so I'm just going to move this like down here so well that's even worse I'm going to stop and just okay. recognize that this is really hard and that's the point this is something that we're going to have to tackle at some point we're going to have to tackle the fact that we could make this definition 25 percent of New York City and 25 percent of New York we could make it something else. We could make something in the middle, but this is where Sonal, you're getting at it in a in a different way, which is basically saying, can we use different indicators for different regions? Um, which yes, you can. We can also designate certain amount of shares for this, and it's a policy driven focus discussion rather than a data driven discussion. Right. Right. So yeah, there's no right definition of of what communities are disadvantaged and the data can really, if we put all the variables that we have in one big index, it might very well show up that um, a certain urban or New York City communities are more disadvantaged and, and just kind of weighted toward the variables we used or the data we had. So, um, so yeah, it's, you know, we can wait things in any way, but they're going to show a certain distribution. So I think the question is on slide 18 there, whether, whether it's okay. And we just want to use those variables um, because we think they're important and see how they fall. And maybe one black circle is bigger than the other black circle, or do we want to do something to say, you know what, um, you know, our sense is that, um, and we'd have to defend this, that, you know, the black circle should be proportionally the same size relative to the blue circles. So Eddie has um, a question, but I did want to say maybe maybe it'll be clearer to us if we were doing this exercise with the indicators we're talking about, right? Because I, you did this 
um, analogy using the interim approach, which is a very simplistic, mm -hmm. only has like three things in it. Whereas yeah. our indicators are trying to get more at pollution burden, the health information, all of that stuff. But Eddie, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I was, this moment was eventually going to come and <laughs> I've been dreading this moment. Um, Part, there are a few problems and dynamics at play, right? You, you, you folks accurately flag that there are people that are going to be looking out for the, and they should be looking out for their particular region of the state. Um, and, and to make matters even more complicated, the nature of environmental justice um, advocacy is that we we are very embracing of each other as disproportionately burdened communities. Um, when it comes to zero sum kinds of equations like this we don't do as well and 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 i'm um, i i personally think i'm i know i'm going to need more time to kind of like just better understand what it would be useful to know what the different options are uh because i think that that at the end of the day no matter what our um no matter what our respective regional allegiances are um None of I can't imagine any of us wanting to land on a definition that excludes authentically mm -hmm. disadvantaged communities. You, you know what I mean? And 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 there's law, there's always this this constant. New York City has the bulk of 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 so much in terms of its density, including disadvantaged communities. Um, but we also have to be mindful. Of, of 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 our brother and sister communities throughout the state, so I um, I'm going to need more uh, uh, ways of looking at this so that I feel like I can do justice both to my members and the folks I live with here in the city, as well as making sure that we're not somehow um, um, you know uh, undermining uh, other um ej communities throughout the state i, I don't know if, 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 about how the folks i see brower agree so. oh i think everyone's right. gonna agree i agree um it's really hard to try to do this theoretically but one of the things that is really important for us to just put it out on the table now in, in terms of transparency is that this is going to be an issue and there are so many methodological ways that i can try to tackle this by like the different again ingredients the different indicators that we use in different places what I want to get at, my goal for this, like our goal, is to come up with the truthiest truth of what is really a disadvantaged community versus what isn't. And and there are some places where the data aren't going to be enough for me. And so, yes, this is something that you're going to need before you can even say much other than this is important. It's going to be hard. You're going to have different different opinions on it that we have to get to the best definition that we can, the best set of criteria that we can to make sure that we're not excluding anyone, but that we're also making sure that we're getting exactly what we need. Um, so that's why we're bringing it up now with a full recognition that that I just, you know, pushed you all to like learn statistics in 10 minutes. And then now I'm pushing you all to like make hard choices. I get it, but like if I didn't bring this up now and I gave you 20 different solutions, it would be a really bad thing for me to do. Um, so I hear you. I'd love to hear from others. Sonal, you have your hand up. Yeah, I mean, I'm really excited for this conversation that started here and I recognize there's 15 minutes. So I'm, I'm assuming that this isn't gonna be the end all be all here. <laughs> um, just to kind of explain a little bit about why I made that comment earlier about different indicators in different regions is also just the consideration that some indicators have better data in different parts of the region and how are we considering and I guess prioritizing um, you know the fact that there's good data or the fact that there isn't good data and that's why we don't use it even if maybe there's it's really rich information in one part of the region but doesn't give us rich information in another part of the region. Um, so mm -hmm. that's kind of why I was thinking about it, and you know, I think yeah. those considerations lend to this discussion here. Yeah, they totally do, um, and I think that you're right. One of the things that we're going to be trying to do, again, it's so theoretical now that we're just 
gotten to the point where we like have the document of the snapshots, but is to try to to model some of these different parts, right? And and I will say this: we're taking like a, a top-down theoretical approach, kind of like California has taken, as far as like, well, we know data-driven wise that these things lead to X, Y, and Z. We're also taking a bottom-up approach, like a data-driven approach, um, to say like, well, we have all these data points. Can they give us something that's really like accurate, even if it's not always theoretically like perfectly a, a straight line from, you know, car ownership to DAC, like specific concrete thing. And we're going to meet in the middle. Um, Amanda is taking on that top down approach and I'm going to take the bottom up approach as far as like on our side methodologically and we're going to get there. Um, and in that is. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, I'm going to let you finish. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, it's okay. Uh, well, I'll just say that in that we will hopefully come up with some magic that gets at the truth. But um, that also means that we have to be thinking so to the point of some indicators are better than others in this area. And that's a very bottom up kind of thought, right? That's why I don't want to exclude that idea of just doing this like theoretically driven. Top bottom top down approach. Go for it, Rawa. I guess my question is, um, and Eddie actually put something in the chat that might be useful. Um, the question that we're being asked today, right? If we say, sure, use this where we're at today, what, whatever you presented as the baseline, um, as a decision point, as a place to start, as a jumping off point, like what other decision points do we have and when uh, to make sure that, um, you know, I think the, the root of what you're trying to get to, which is, are, is this the real story of what a disadvantaged community is? Um, and then if we don't make this decision today, what happens? Well, I didn't want you to make this decision today because um, it just can't, right? Like we have to see what the data look like. Uh, but through these next couple working group meetings, and I think um, through the webinars that we're hoping to do in addition to those, is to bring up some of these like really hard questions of things to consider so that when we give you the scenarios we give you, you'll have all of the sub questions that come under that or the assumptions. So some of the scenarios we give you are going to assume, you know, a data driven approach, whatever. And some of them are going to be other ways of breaking down the data, different indicators or different weighting of indicators and that kind of stuff. And so this is where that comes from. Um, but it's hard timeline wise. I mean, right now trying to do all of this, um, in my view, what I've been trying to do is like, we have this time set out and we need to use it so that, that we're getting everyone thinking about things at the right place. But we're also like waiting on doing all that chugging of data. Now that we have a smaller list of indicators, we've got that down. We're starting to work on the data analysis, but that takes time. So during that time that we can't give you specific examples, here's what we can do. We can bring up the hard decisions that we anticipate are going to happen. And this is one of them. So, Alex, I think because we have 10 minutes left um, and I want to go through our next steps. Can you just flag what you think are the next steps um, using those data snapshots that you want me to send around to everyone? Yes. Yeah. So with those snapshots, if you all can look at them and make note of anything, you're like, ha, huh, that seems really weird or like. This looks like a super nice. important indicator, something like that. That is great. Um, you can also send it to your experts and they can be like that benzene measure measure is not right. Or this is that this is where we can actually use some of that input from, you know, your subject matter experts that will help us. We're always trying to take in more information that way. At that same time, we're going to be in the back end continuing our many, many uh, meetings with different subject matter experts to narrow it down and get to the best indicators we can. And we're now starting to like number crunch and do the analysis to get at some portion of, you know, this definition. So that's where we're going as far as next steps. Please look at those snapshots and then um, think about these critical decisions. Like, how are we going to, how are we going to get to this? Because the, the soup to nuts, like the, the hard parts of what I just discussed, they're hard and they're hard to, to explain, but they're also hard to make a decision on. So please think about those things 
when you're thinking about your community and who you're representing and 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 also just the ethics of wanting to to capture the truthiest truth um, that we can. I also, as far as next steps, wanted to bring up the fact that Cal Virus Green just released a new update, and there's and going to be a webinar on March 3rd. Um, and I would urge you all to attend. And and this is also because Rosa, you wanted to mention we have a webinar with the California people as well. So this would be, I think, really useful to to attend prior to that or in tandem with it. Great, thanks, Alex. So so that was gonna be my flag for the working group that we did secure the uh, California representatives that you asked us to reach out to. So we have Yana Garcia of Cal UPAEJ we have Diane Techvorian and Martha Arguello coming to our March 12th meeting, um, 8 a.m. their time, 11 a.m. for us. So they're joining us bright and early. I wanted to ask if you have specific questions for, for our guests, it would be great if you could email them to me, particularly if it's something that they would need to prepare for. So if it was about um, an experience they might have had or, or some kind of reporting that you'd like them to reflect on. Um, that would be great. So they can be ready to answer your questions during that time. And then also, as usual, I will be sending out the draft minutes from this meeting for you to look over so that we can approve them at the next meeting. We also will be sharing those data snapshots that, that Alex mentioned. And I will offer again, if you needed or wanted to have some time to talk it over, we can set up one hour sessions. You know, I'm happy to, to walk through things with anyone. Um, and also to talk about the experience with this working group, because we're always trying to make sure we're holding the meetings in the most efficient way, most beneficial way to get our, our work done. All right, Any anything else to note before we head out and enjoy the rest of our evenings? I want to thank you all for bearing through the hardness of this. I know it's, I know it's hard, but thank you. I appreciate it. It was great. I want to go back to school. I'll just note that they use me as the test subject for their explanations because I figured to get Rosa to understand that. So it took, I think I took statistics when I was 19 was the last time. So. <laughs> it's the best. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank all. you. Thank you. Bye bye.